just make a few opening remarks. At a time of weak economic growth across most economies, the importance of technology and its application has become paramount. Tapping into the virtuous feedback loop between technology-enabled productivity, rising wages, and higher economic growth represents the golden prize for policymakers across the globe. But the importance of technology extends well beyond the productivity impact. Technology has the potential of transforming society and tackling some of the most significant global challenges that we face. It is therefore no surprise that the governments here in the Gulf, as in most other parts of the world, have prioritized the development of an ecosystem that will enable technology-based entities to flourish. Of course, such development requires long-term and costly investments in education and infrastructure. It also requires partnership with and participation by other stakeholders, particularly private sector businesses. The evidence suggests that GCC countries are doing many of the right things to create an appropriate regulatory and business environment. The World Economic Forum produces an annual index which attempts to measure how individual countries are able to leverage information and communication technologies. The National Readiness Index, or NRI, is a good proxy to measure relative cross-country performance in this area and, unsurprisingly, shows a high correlation between a country's level of income and performance in the index. The 2015 NRI illustrates the strong commitment of GCC countries to ICC, ICT development. UAE ranks 23rd out of 143 countries, Qatar 27th, Bahrain 30th, Saudi Arabia 35th, and Oman 42nd. Recent evidence suggests this commitment is increasing. We've heard both from Minister al Zayi last night and earlier this afternoon from Khalid al Rumaini about Bahrain's ambitious commitment to invest in education and infrastructure. We've also heard the announcement of the first Middle East cloud acceleration program to be based here in Bahrain. Elsewhere in the region, we've heard that UAE announced it planned to invest $82 billion to build the country's knowledge economy involving 100 national initiatives in education, health, energy, and transportation. GCC countries, of course, have the additional and pressing incentive to diversify economic activity and to reduce reliance on hydrocarbons to, in effect, lay the groundwork for a post-oil economy. So while GCC countries are doing much to build capacity to foster technology-intensive economies, more still needs to be done. Education is of particular importance. It is perhaps no surprise that centres of technological innovation have typically grown up around great universities and colleges. As is well documented, GCC countries still face a skills challenge, and I know this is an area that Teresa will touch on in her opening remarks. While we stress the power of technology to improve lives and drive economic growth, we must also consider the risks that are associated with the increased adoption of technologies. We are witnessing the risks and cost of cybercrime and even cyber warfare. This is a very topical issue, not least here in the Gulf. We are fortunate to have a leading expert in the area of cybersecurity on our panel, Andre Pinar, and we look forward to his input. In addition to cyber threats, we also have to consider the risks that come from the adoption of technology, in particular software automation and predictive algorithms on the job market. These risks are starkly set out in a recent book by Martin Ford entitled The Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of Mass Unemployment. Opportunities and risks abound, but it is quite clear that technology and its integration into the economy is a topic that is likely to dominate decision-makers' agendas here in Bahrain, in the Gulf, and indeed across the world. It is therefore fortunate that we have such a distinguished and expert panel to lead our discussions on this subject. I have asked each panelist to make some opening remarks, but to confine these remarks to a maximum of 10 minutes each, which should give us good time for a debate and questions in, uh, from the floor. So now let me introduce the first of our panelists, Teresa Carlson. Teresa is Vice President of Amazon Web Services Worldwide Public Sector. Therese acts as an advisor to Amazon Public Policy on global policy issues, has enjoyed a stellar career both at Amazon and previously at Microsoft, where she was Vice President 
of Microsoft Federal Government. Teresa, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I've got 30 minutes of remarks. I hope that's okay. <laughs> so good afternoon. So let's talk about cloud computing. Um, as Jens mentioned, I run our worldwide public sector business, and I'm very passionate about that business. It includes governments of all kinds around the world, central government, state and local. I have educational institutions, both higher ed, K through 12, public and private. I have the opportunity to work with amazing technology education companies. And then I also work with not-for-profits around the world and uh, non-governmental organizations like USAID, World Bank, IMF, Red Cross, and many, many others. So uh, what does this thing, cloud computing, even mean? You've sort of been hearing about it. And the term cloud computing is actually um, not really that new, but it's come on the scene in the last six or seven years pretty strong. And it's really on-demand IT resources uh, via the internet. And believe it or not, you only pay for what you use. So why are we talking about cloud computing today at a conference like this? Well, we are because the story of Amazon and how we got into cloud computing is actually a really important story. And it's also a story that helps us understand how companies, small businesses, startups, and governments can be powered by the use of new technologies in innovative ways in an on-demand uh, perspective so that they can only pay for what they use, which really gives them more money for their mission and for their business. And at Amazon, we actually found that our business was being slowed down because we didn't have the right kind of IT resources. Even though we were power, powering a very large um, global company on the retail side, when they started looking at growing new business lines, we found that we were actually moving slowly. And what we found, it was really our IT resources that were slowing us down. But we had learned so much from how we had powered our retail business, which was built on web services, and we started saying, okay, let's take all of our experiences over the past 10 years of doing a retail business and bring those to the consumer world and let's provide them the on-demand IT resources that we've learned to utilize for our Amazon.com business. And as a result, today, Amazon Web Services is one of the lines of businesses at Amazon uh, Inc incorporated, obviously, and we are the fastest growing segment of that business today. I thought you might find it interesting to hear sort of what we do at Amazon Web Services. We're really a big engineering and logistics company. We go around the world, we build massive data centers and power the cloud. We work uh, with all types of companies, but the, the interesting element of really what got our business started was developers. The developers were the ones that really started utilizing AWS and then startups. And today, more startups than any utilize AWS to begin and start their company. And I want to pick at that subject for just a moment because that is where I think cloud is an amazing opportunity for the Middle East. Because if you can begin to think about how you power companies and businesses in a way that they can um, grow and develop yet fail fast and learn from those failures in a way that's not detrimental to the pace of how they get their business started, cloud is the way that you want to go. We today around the world have 11 regions. And what a region is for us, it's a cloud center basically where we build uh, more than one data center. We, we build multiple data centers and clusters. And we have 11 of those regions around the world today. And we just announced three, one in Korea, one in India, and one in the UK. You'll hear us continue to announce more. Unfortunately, right now today, we don't have any regions in the Middle East or in Africa, but in the fullness of time, I'm sure that will absolutely change. So I want to talk to you and give you a couple of case studies on how cloud is actually utilized, and then let's explore for just a minute how it can actually support 
and drive the economy in a big way in the Middle East. So I wanted to give you an example from the financial sector, because here in Bahrain, I think it's fantastic that it is literally a centralized location for finance and banking for the Middle East. And what we're finding is that banks are actually uh, picking up and utilizing cloud in a new way to actually power their business and have it as an undifferentiated model for what they're doing. In the U.S., Capital One is a Fortune 500 company and one of our largest banks that we work with, with more than 50 million consumers, small businesses, and commercial clients. And the AWS cloud has become a central part of their technology strategy. And we're helping them reduce both their data center footprint and heighten their security and improve their overall customer service. As a result of moving to AWS, Capital One expects to reduce its data center footprint from eight to three by 2018. And it's using and experimenting with nearly every AWS service to develop, test, and build and run its most critical and mission workloads, including its new flagship mobile banking application. As I've mentioned to you earlier, we succeed when our customers actually succeed. We're a very customer-centric uh, company and regarding their move to AWS, the CIO of Capital One says the financial service industry attracts some of the worst cyber criminals. And we work closely with AWS to develop a security model which we believe enables us to operate more securely in the public cloud. And we can, as we can in our own data centers. And we hear that over and over from customers now today, that security is actually a reason now that they are moving to the cloud. And they ultimately selected AWS for its security model and their ability to provision their infrastructure on the fly in an elastic manner to handle all their purchasing demands at peak times. And what they told us is they are really thrilled with the availability and their ability to roll out new services very rapidly. And I think this is the key to be really competitive in business today, you almost have to be running on the cloud so you can develop your services really fast, test those services, and deploy them globally. Another example that I want to share with you is one in the health sector. And this is really accelerating the research and discovery side. Uh, we host today a selection of public data sets that demonstrates the power of open data. In the past, if you, it, there, there's so many amazing data sets out there that uh, in the past, researchers, governments, individual educators could not get to. And as, as a result of the open data program on the cloud, we are making these data sets available at no cost and to drive new businesses and accelerate research and really improve lives and make the world a better place. And by hosting these key data sets, we enable more innovation quickly and create, creating really additional opportunities for public good. We have the Cancer Genome Atlas and the Pan Cancer data sets. They're great examples of how the cloud is a game changer for the health field. And qualified researchers now can access two of the world's largest collections of cancer genomes data at no cost. One quick example I'll talk to you about is Berkeley Amp Labs. Berkeley Amp Labs uh, today has utilized the cloud to literally map the genomes of every cancer type. And with that, what they state is they believe that within the next 25 years, because of the knowledge that we've gained from those genomic cancer data sets, that we will be able to live chronically with almost every cancer type versus terminally, which is really a game changer. And that's been because of the way that they've been able to take and utilize the big data around the genomes and really understand how are they similar in pattern and reach and what kind of drugs affect those cancer types the most. So we are really proud of our work that we've been able to do to speed along both research on the cancer and drug treatment side. Provisioning these type of data sets, it takes massive infrastructure to do this. And one of the other things that we've been able to do is actually create models for um, crowdsourcing around the research through executable white papers. So if you do, if you create data sets and uh, computations and algorithms around those patterning, then you can put those up on the web, 
you can have a hot link to those genomic data sets, and when you hit those, you can actually begin to use a previous researcher's knowledge base. So you've already created an opportunity to go from zero to 50 really fast versus start at zero again. And that's what we hear over and over from these researchers. The last example I'm going to tell you is another data set, which is really a cool data set. It's a public data set uh, around Landsat data. And this is one that my team worked on this past year with the U.S. Uh, Geological Survey Program and their, lands, their Landsat satellite program. Uh, this is really the gold standard for geographic satellite imagery. And many of our customers were coming to us saying that they really couldn't access this. And we put this up on AWS, and within two weeks we had over 10 new partners and this was requested, the data sets were requested over 500 million times globally. So this is just an example how rapidly that these things can really grow. And what we try to do with these is we go to the governments around the world, we ask them to give us their most difficult data sets, we put them out there, and then we allow individuals to crowdsource and do things with them. Because many of these have been closed for so long. All right. Now. Let's talk about why this matters in the Middle East. What's the real opportunity? Well, clearly we see that there's a massive opportunity. I heard a lot this morning on issues. I heard it, but I believe that there are opportunities here to create these partnerships for tech entrepreneurs in the Middle East. When you see the number of startups that are powered by the cloud and the ability to start a business on very little capital, the capital can go a long way, and if we can put the programs in place that really allow these individuals and companies to have the opportunity for the education and the mentorship, they can move very fast because they don't have to take the time anymore to go out and do the whole procurement on the supply chain. We can help them learn from all the experiences that we already have in terms of our knowledge and growth from these companies. So one of the things that I thought um, as we worked with Bahrain here, I don't know if you all uh, heard our announcement this morning, but we announced our acceleration program with the Economic Development Board, C5 and Tim Keene. And I really believe this is a game-changing opportunity between the government and the private sector to do something really unique and showcase in the region how we can power individuals and companies we had the opportunity over the last few weeks to spend time with these companies and really begin to understand what are their business problems, but not just their business problems, what are their business opportunities? And what we found was that there was a tremendous amount of knowledge within these individuals and companies, but what they needed was a game-changing set of technologies that could allow them to both scale their business very rapidly and then take it globally. Because the benefit here is not just for a local approach to the business, but it's really for the regional and global approach to the business. Because why shouldn't these entrepreneurs have the opportunity to open up their model of business to locations around the world, just like Amazon.com does? And I think we're a perfect example of, um, of how the cloud has powered our, our business and we've been able to grow and scale it. And I tell the story very often, we started this business in 2006 with one service called Simple Storage Service. Fast forward today and we now deploy uh, over 600 new services a year. It's unprecedented. And what that allows is for the companies and the partner ecosystem that we work with to power their business and move much, much faster. So with that, there's definitely opportunities for entrepreneurship here, and we are really excited about supporting that. And technology is a major business driver. It's not the panacea, but it is a major business driver if we utilize it in the right way. Now with that, one of the points that I wanted to state was policy though. In order for us to really take advantage of the technology in the right way, we do have to have a policy-friendly environment. Because if you try to standardize too many things when it comes to technology, it actually stagnates innovation and entrepreneurship. So I believe what I've seen here today is that Bahrain is really a great partner in terms of they've already been very open about wanting to understand what are the right policy sets that they need to be driving. 
because um, I spend a lot of my time around the world with a lot of governments, and the first reaction to something new is to lock it down because they don't understand it. But this is an opportunity, it's already proven, we want to be able to help them seek to understand and share the knowledge that we've already gained from around the world. So um, the key is going to be for us to spend some time, work on the policy, really get that right, and then really scale this across the region. When people ask me today, so what are the barriers? Why are people not adopting cloud? Well, believe it or not, it's not security anymore. Security in the early days was the reason people were very scared. And it, look, it's new. When things are new, you tend to sort of have a, almost a visceral reaction to doing something that's new. But um, it's important to try it. So our approach is always, let's go in, let's teach people how to fish, let's go slowly, because what we found with cloud, and it's not, it's an example of every Silicon Valley startup that you can think of that now utilizes AWS in the cloud, they scale fast, so experience gets you there very fast once you start utilizing it. But with that, what do we need is skills. And one of our major goals in this region is to skill up. And what are we going to do to skill up? How do we do that? What's our solution? We're going to work with our Accelerate program, but we also launched at AWS a program called AWS Educate in April. And that program is we are giving millions of dollars away in uh, credits and training. We're crowdsourcing the best and brightest uh, computer science professors in the world. They're sharing their knowledge of what they're doing in computer science. And we're crowdsourcing that for them to be able to teach and train these courses around the world. We're providing free training, free credits. Uh, we're also providing certification programs, so when these students walk out the door, they literally have a standard, a badge that says, I'm qualified to actually work in cloud computing. And IDC just uh, did a study last year that said there's 15 million jobs that have been created from cloud. And I can tell you, we have a ton of openings, and what we need to do is create all those jobs right here. There's no reason why all those jobs could not be available right here in the Middle East in Bahrain. So with that, I am really excited to be here. And I really think that we are doing something in a public-private partnership here with the government and our partner C5 that is truly game-changing. And I'm really happy to be talking to you about it on this panel. So thank you all. Thank you very much indeed, Teresa. Thank you for giving us such an uh, encouraging outlook. And I think it is really extraordinary to reflect on the opportunity that cloud computing does bring to start our businesses and how important a message this is uh, here in Bahrain, here in the Gulf. So I think that's been really, and I'm sure that we want to come back to a number of the issues that Teresa raised in her talk uh, after uh, when we open up the questions. But now let me turn to Abdul Rahman Al Hajri. Abdul Rahman is the Business Development Manager at Tacnia, which is the Saudi technology development and investment company. Tacnia is owned by the Public Investment Fund, the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Saudi Arabia. Prior to joining Tacnia, uh, Abdul Rahman worked in business development at Saudi Aramco. So, Abdul Rahman, the dais is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Your Highnesses, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, I would like first to thank the State of Bahrain for its usual hospitality, thank Dr. Sanjay Barrow for his kind invitation, the IISS for its usual efforts in bridging the gap between different views and supporting intra global collaboration and cooperation. Uh, about a month ago, here in Bahrain, His Excellency uh, Adil al Jubair, the Saudi Arabian Minister of Foreign Affairs, said here in his speech in the Manama Dialogue in a session titled The Region After the Nuclear Negotiations, said the following, in the future the GCC states face four key challenges and three key opportunities. The challenges were Syria, Yemen, Iraq and terrorism. And the three opportunities were economic development and investment, 
Economic Development and Investment, Youth and Technology. And this is why I'm here today. I'm trying to shed more light on these three opportunities. I'm not a politician, so I'm not going to touch any, any challenges. But these opportunities could actually be the reasons uh, for building a global technology development hub here in the GCC. Yet, there are implicit challenges within those opportunities. And in my humble opinion, they are the lack of legislative and regulatory system that supports entrepreneurship and innovation. Second is lack of enough technical and capable workforce that is required to work in technology development. And the third is the lack of focus in scientific R&D and its commercialization efforts in order to turn them into actual tangible products and services. So we know that the Gulf states are fairly young. Some of them actually just turned these days 45 years old. And in addition, in the past, GC states were almost entirely dependent on their natural resources to build their economies and infrastructure. Nevertheless, as the world is always changing, and in light of the fluctuation of oil prices, the world's de determination to develop alternative sources of energy, and the emergence of global economic powers, such as China, India, Brazil, and Malaysia, that actually used technology to compete globally. In the light of these facts, the Gulf states decided to participate in the world's development of globally competitive and innovative technology through two main work streams, and that's by building the proper ecosystem, the environment that supports entrepreneurship and innovation, and investing in its youth to develop their knowledge and skills. So the Gulf states use the advantage of its political and economic stability to develop the policies and plans to reach that goal. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia approved a few years ago the National Policy for Science and Technology and had King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology CAXT, the Saudi Arabian National R&D Center, craft the National Science, Technology and Innovation Plan, NSTIP, or Ma'rifa, which is Arabic for knowledge. Ma'rifa aims to build a knowledge-based economy in Saudi Arabia to make the country a leading global provider of scientific, technological, and innovative solution to our modern challenges. And, that's, and the aim is to do that by 2030. The plan has specified 15 strategic types of industries where focus shall be applied. These include water technology, biotechnology, information technology, energy, space, advanced materials, agriculture, and life sciences, and healthcare technologies. One of the most recent results of this policy is, on this plan, is the birth of Taqnia, the Saudi Technology Development and Investment Company, in 2011. Taqnia is owned by the Public Investment Fund, which is the Sovereign Wealth Fund of Saudi Arabia, headed by, or chaired by His Highness, Dr. Turki bin Saud, the President of CAXT, King Abdelaziz City for Science and Technology. Taqnia works today to drive the accelerated diversification of the kingdom's economy through the development of knowledge-based industries, thereby creating high-value adding jobs and creating the innovative ecosystem required in the kingdom. Technia adopts three main work streams. The first is industries, where I work, and we develop and execute joint ventures with international players in six key areas, six key sectors. Uh, water technologies and life sciences and healthcare and ICT is some of them. The second work stream is investments where we're developing VC funds in the kingdom to promote promising local startups. And the third, and we actually do also direct investment in promising startups internationally in the US is, is our key area of operations now and services or commercialization services is the third 
is a third work stream where we work with our local R&D centers to turn local R&D into tangible products and services. Moreover, today, there are several public and private incubators, VC funding groups, and SME funding and support organizations in Saudi Arabia, both public and private. And the, very recently, the General Authority of Small and Medium Enterprises was just created to regulate and develop the SME's sector, small and medium enterprises, and increase its contribution to the GDP and job creation. Very quickly in Bahrain, we have the EDB chairman or CEO here, uh, Mr. Khaled Ramehi, and he can elaborate on this. But in Bahrain's vision, as I read it, by 2030, has led the EDB to do great work in bringing technology investments into the kingdom. And the deal that was signed today is just this, a sign of this with, with Amazon. Uh, very smart attention is being given to IT and IT-enabled services which proved to be successful. And while you're here in Bahrain, I advise you to visit the EDB and, 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 and get more on, on how to invest here in the, in the Kingdom of Bahrain. A few days ago, as Jens just signaled to, the United Arab Emirates has announced the endorsement of its policy for science and technology and innovation, including 100 national initiatives in education, health, energy, transportation, and other sectors. Uh, with an investment of more than 300 billion dirhams, around 82 billion dollars. The policy targets tripling the UAE's R&D spending as a percentage of its GDP by 2021. A great example from Kuwait is the National Technology Enterprises Company, NTEC, or NTEC, was established back in November 2002 as a fully owned subsidiary of KIA, the Kuwait Investment Authority. Just like Tecnia, NTEC or NTEC, the company holds a unique position, being fully owned and funded by the government, yet enjoys all private sector privileges and operates as such. NTEC was able to utilize its broad objectives and technology focus, being information and communication technologies, life sciences and healthcare, energy, renewable energy, water and environmental technologies. They use these to develop distinctive and operational and investment strategi strategies to address its core mandate, which is ours also, technology and know-how transfer. It now owns and operates five fully owned subsidiaries. In the state of Qatar, economic diversification was one of the most important initiatives of Qatar's vision 2030. The initiative supports SMEs that make up only today only about 15% of Qatar's economy. Therefore, the SME or Qatar SME Authority was launched very recently in order to increase that percentage through awarding performance-based grants to local SMEs. Add to this, Qatar has just allocated 2.8% of their budget to support R&D initiatives that are being carried out at two main government entities, Qatar Foundation and the Science and Technology Park in Qatar. I'll have to conclude with Oman. Our brothers in Oman, the Omani Authority for Partnership was created very recently also to facilitate the investment and promotion of technology development initiatives and the Research Council, TRC of Oman, is leading today and sponsoring several international research collaborations, local innovation, and scientific research support programs. If I quickly touch a bit on the opportunity of having around 70% of the GCC population under the age of 30, the GCC states do recognize the value of education and training and have invested heavily in developing the capability of its youth. Uh, for example, uh, we discussed just before the session in the skills gap workshop or session, the uh, custodian of the Toholi Mosques program for external scholarships that has educated so far around 200,000 students, both male and female, in different parts of the world. 
The program is now being transformed, actually, to link it directly to the government organizations and government-owned companies' requirements of skills and knowledge. Another example is in Qatar, which has adopted a new state-of-the-art educational system that converted all its national schools into independent schools. That's what it's called, actually where the school is still funded by the government, but independently managed with special focus on math and science. And I have to mention that the, uh, some of the best schools in the world today actually are here in the GCC, in Qatar, Dubai, Bahrain, and some in Saudi also. Cornell are here, Texas A&M, Carnegie Mellon, Georgetown, Northwestern, LBS, London Business School, INSEAD, HEC, HEC Paris in Doha, and others are coming. So I have to say that still there is a lot to do, a lot more to do, especially when it comes to fixing the foreign investment regulations, for example, or the development of, of technical uh, workforce here in the GCC. Uh, yet, as I recall, Dr. Sanjay's well question yesterday, can we be optimistic about the region? Uh, I can answer that by borrowing another quote from His Excellency Dr. Ad, uh, Mr. Adil Al-Jabir, our Minister of State, where he said, those who bet against the GC states are likely to lose, and I would recommend betting for them. But I can add, yes, let's be optimistic and know that a civilization that started in this region has once led the world's efforts and endeavors in science and innovation, and I believe this can happen once again. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul Rahman, for giving us such a comprehensive and interesting view of developments in the region uh, to develop and expand the technology base. That was really interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Andre, you have a, a challenge as our third panelist. Of, we've had two very optimistic inputs so far. Let's see whether you can keep that going. Our third panelist, Andre Pinar, is the founder and executive chairman of C5, an investment company that invests in cybersecurity and big data analytic company in, in the EMEA region. Andre previously founded and was CEO of G3, a security and risk consulting firm. He also spent eight years as chief executive of Kroll Associates in London. Andre is an advocate of the Supreme Court of South Africa and is a specialist in cyber law. Andre. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to go with him. Um the sense of optimism from my colleagues on the panel and um, start with an anecdote about a young man who had a dream. One of my best friends at school, whom I won't name, had a dream of becoming a great writer. And I can still remember when his mother asked him what it would mean in his view to be a truly great writer. And he explained to his mother with great passion that he would feel he's become a truly great writer when the things that he writes is read by millions of people all over the world and he's able to connect with those readers at a deep emotional level that is able to make them cry is able to make them feel things intensely unlock real emotions like anger and really connect with them well I'm happy to report to you today that this young man today feels that he's accomplished all those objectives because he's become a uh, the writer of error messages for Microsoft Windows products, including the most recent release. Now, though, although for, for most of us, some of the time, technology can be very frustrating, it is today the major source of growth in the global economy. We live today in the second machine age, and the impact of technology growth is evidenced, for example, by the impact that high-quality technology companies have had on the real estate market in places like San Francisco, which is today one of the hottest real estate cities in the world. It's evidenced today by the growth in the U.S. stock market this year, which has been fueled by the so-called FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, these four technology companies have delivered most of the growth in the U.S. stock market this year. As a result, exposure to technology today is not optional for a country that wants to deliver 
inclusive and sustainable economic growth for its people, it is rather essential. The question, therefore, is what does it take to plug into global technology growth? What does it take to establish a local technology sector? My grandmother baked some of the most delicious puddings, including uh, uh, Um Ali, that was a great source of comfort to me as a little boy. And when I asked the grandma, why is your Um Ali always the best? She said, my boy, I stick to a recipe. So today I want to give you a recipe with seven ingredients for establishing a technology sector in Bahrain. The first ingredient, rather surprisingly, has nothing to do with technology. It's all about people. Amazon has a saying, smart is beautiful. There's an old Arabic proverb which says, smart people are blessed. Bahrain fortunately is blessed with many smart people. And the smartness of the people of Bahrain comes from their curiosity, their work ethic, their willingness and their culture to share with others, and their values. And this gives the foundation for establishing a technology sector. The second ingredient are good universities. Bahrain has more than 20 world-class universities, and the infrastructure and the innovation and the thinking and the research that are done at universities like these can very easily be leveraged for the purposes of technology innovation and for fostering and encouraging startups. And this has been done successfully all around the world. The third ingredient are international networks. The Crown Prince of Bahrain recently said Bahrain is an island, but its economy is not. And this has always been true of the history of this island. Bahrain was the first country to introduce aviation into the region and has always been outward looking. Building international networks, accessing research, knowledge, partners, uh, innovation from other parts of the world are absolutely essential for building a, a technology sector. The fourth ingredient is finance. All four of the sources of capital that play a crucial role in technology sectors elsewhere in the world, government, strategic investors, which consist of large corporations that need innovation, investment banks and funds are present here in Bahrain. In addition, I think uh, technology investment are also very much aligned to the values of Islamic investment and Islam Islamic finance because it places an emphasis on profit sharing and value creation and Bahrain as one of the leading centers of Islamic finance are well placed to use this for the purposes of innovation. The fifth ingredient is to follow in the footsteps of giants. I grew up as a child in Africa and as a little boy often saw elephant herds moving around and whenever the elephants moved around they seldom moved around alone. They were always followed by little buck, sometimes a baboon, lots of little birds, and these animals followed the big giants because they found safety with them, but also they found opportunities they wouldn't otherwise access. Today, the, the internet is dominated by seven or eight global giants, uh, five of which are American, three of which are Chinese, and attracting these giants to Bahrain will bring the ecosystem with them and access to an economy that now exceeds more than two and a half trillion dollars and it's another very important ingredient. And I think the announcement we made this morning is the first step in this direction. The sixth ingredient is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity provides assurance to all internet users to access different services and products, whether that's entertainment, education, banking, uh, or specific products and is therefore an essential ingredient for a stable and growing uh, internet-based economy. Unfortunately, cybersecurity is constantly challenged by organized crime groups who are intent on profiting at other people's expense. And most recently, the New York Times reported that Iran is increasingly using uh, cyber warfare as a means to destabilize this region and other parts of the world in the wake of the nuclear agreement that's been signed. As my friend Ian uh, Lobben taught me, there's no one panacea for cybersecurity. 
And to secure the internet requires a smart coalition between government and the private sector. It also requires a combination of education, services, software products, and constant vigilance. And therefore, cybersecurity remains a constant quest. I'm pleased to announce that C5 has been working over the course of the last year to establish a center of excellence with one of Bahrain's leading universities in this field to train Bahrainis both as students but also in business in the field of cybersecurity. Finally, the final and most important ingredient, leadership. Abraham Lincoln said, the surest way to predict your future is to create it yourself, and leaders create the future. Establishing technology as a key part of the Bahraini economy will take great determination but fortunately, Bahrain has this leadership, and Bahrain has always led in the region, and I believe will continue to do so. Thank you. Andre, thank you very much indeed. I particularly value the very specific uh, suggestions made. Um, I'm not sure about um, the following the elephants, but I think certainly the idea of bringing um, business, foreign businesses to Bahrain is, is an interesting and, 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 and inspiring goal to, to aim for. Um, I, we now want to open up uh, for questions, so if you have any questions, please put up your hand, and if you please refrain from pushing the button until you call, that will help avoid some of the uh, technology clashes we had in earlier sessions. I wonder if I can just start off there. I wanted to ask Abdul Rahman ab about um, two subjects that, that have come up in, in earlier sessions. Uh, Abdul Rahman, we, we talked a, a, a lot about um, cooperation. The, the, the C in GCC comes from cooperation, yet we don't see, or at least I don't see, an enormous amount of evidence of cooperation. It appeared to me that in the area of technology, given that GCC countries have broadly similar issues that they're addressing, broadly similar agendas and broadly similar cultures, that there would be quite a lot of merit in further cooperation rather than each country trying to replicate its own very specific set of, of, of institutions and organizations. Um, I'd like to get your view on, uh, on the prospects for cooperation and what you think might be happening there or what, what is the barrier perhaps to it happening. It's a very good question. I was dying yesterday to redirect that question to uh, His Excellency the Minister Zayani last night. And because I, I, I was expecting that kind of question, uh, how much collaboration, how much cooperation is there between and among the GCC states? And the short answer is there is collaboration and there is a fairly good amount uh, or good level of collaboration among the GCC states, but it's not focused and it's not enough. Uh, their main focus today is on industrial manufacturing and industrial services rather than technology development and building the right infrastructure or the legal framework for supporting entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, we can see the, the uh, good quality of separate initiatives that are taking place within uh, each of the uh, GCC states, but uh, uh, no, there is not enough in my own opinion. We ask for more and uh, I hope uh, one of the ministers were, were, you know, was able to take this because I, I would be asking them the same question. Thank you, Abdul Rahman. Um, I think we have a question from over there. Yes, please go ahead. <clears throat> yes, this is a question for um, Mr. Hajri as well. Um, my name is Omar Abedli from Bahrain Center for Strategic Studies. On the right side here. Um, you mentioned that in terms of research collaboration, you want to be asking the question to, um, uh, to the minister. Personally, um, as someone who has some knowledge of the history of, the, of, of, scientific, uh, 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 of scientific research, uh, and even the present when it comes to Western countries, a lot of raw scientific research is actually done by privately funded um, sources, whether it's companies or, um, and this is something that's been historically true, uh, philanthropic um, uh, philanthropists. So for example, if you go to Harvard University, you'll find a lot of chairs funded by 
wealthy individuals um, for purely philanthropic reasons. Um, why do you think it is that in the present day GCC, we don't see so much um, private philanthropic initiative backing as research? We only see people calling on the government to fund these things. And, and in particular, what could, you, what could be done to reverse this? Personally, I think that it, it, it's, uh, it's a shame, and, but it's something that can be addressed. And I, I, don't, I don't like the idea that people constantly demanding that the government has to fix it. The government, people should take the initiative and, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and fund some of the research themselves. Thank you. Well, thank you for a great question. Uh, I guess it's going to be political, I think. I, I mean, it's in the culture. Maybe uh, the people are not used to doing uh, such a thing and, and going uh, for their dreams and, and, and for their passion uh, independently, uh, depending on the available resources. But this has been the culture in the DC states. They have been, the people have been dependent on uh, the government uh, in deciding their fate. I, I have to say it in a clear and, and loud, and, and it has been very good so far, but uh, we will have to uh, make it a bit clearer uh, to decision makers that please uh, let the people carry on and do their uh, thing and, and follow their dreams uh, separately, freely, without the intervention of the government. If I could just very briefly um, just mention one thing in response. Uh, so they have a lot of energy for private, um, organi private ch initiatives when it comes to charity, for example. In the GCC countries, a huge amount of charitable contributions are made within the GCC and outside the GCC as private initiatives without waiting for the government to be a partner or to be a... So why, why do you think the, the, the same person who, who, in the, who, who is willing to do so much in terms of private philanthropy for charitable contributions doesn't seem to have the desire to to change slightly that to different projects? I didn't get your point, honestly. They, they, people do private philanthropy a lot, just it happens to be for maybe for helping poor people, for helping um, orphans, for helping. They don't wait for the government when it comes to doing um, charitable work. So why don't they then take that same mentality to research and, and innovation. Well, can, I, can I assume that philanthropists are usually uh, billionaires? Yeah? Uh, if I make that assumption, that wouldn't be fair to the normal DCC citizen uh, to become a philanthropist. But uh, what, I, what I insist on is, is to promote that, 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 that culture, that thinking in the media, uh, by the government, uh, in our diwaniyat, in our own uh, public house, in our houses. If we develop that culture, then uh, the, that thing should happen. And we've got a question from Bill and then from Yusuf, so we can have those two. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I was delighted to uh, feel the optimism um, at the, uh, from the panelists and the positive thinking, um, it, it, this, the economic cynic in, in, in me made, me, it made, uh, re, made it remind me of the uh, Chicago School of Economics story about um, two Chicago School econo economists walking along the road and one sees a $100 bill on the ground and the other says it can't be a $100 bill because otherwise someone would already have picked it up. So my question is, in a way, why hasn't this already happened? By which I will direct that question um, perhaps more uh, forensically by saying we've been hearing today about two big issues. One is youth unemployment, maybe not so specifically in the Gulf Corporation countries, but in some of them, but a very high population growth, youth unemployment. And secondly, we've been hearing about an industry the oil and gas industry, which is highly um, impacted and disrupted by technology. So can you connect together this conversation about um, the technology potential with these two key facts about the region? One, how is technology a solution for um, 
high population growth and high youth unemployment, what will it do? But secondly, in a way, what the missing link in a technology, technologically transforming industry, why is not the industry in this region being transformed by technology? Thank you, Bill. And I think, Yusuf, you have a question as well. Yeah, and I'll connect, to, uh, I'll uh, continue to what Bill was saying. Is, uh, C5, Amazon, you've signed an excellent deal today. Uh, and uh, it's with uh, EDB in addition to Temkin. Temkin is the main leg of um, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince in labor reforms. And their job is to actually train Bahrainis to make them the uh, uh, the, the choice for employment to Bahraini businesses. Um, I don't understand how will this, what you've done today, and, and I'm very, very glad to see a, 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 a companies from outside actually coming to Bahrain and, and, and taking Bahrain as a center. This is what we want. Uh, but what, how, how will this going to be working? Um, using Tamkeen uh, money and their facilities in what you have done today. My second question, and could be really that I didn't understand, uh, because I'm not really a very uh, experienced in, or I'm not an IT man, is uh, what is the relation between C5 and Amazon? How do we how do we work together? Uh, whether in, in, in Bahrain and hopefully you will have some other places also to do the same thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yusuf. Now we've got, we've got four questions for the price of two, so I'm going to throw this open to each of the panel members. Perhaps, Andre, can I start by asking you to tackle these, as many of them as you feel that you want to add to? Thank you, Jens. Um, I think as to the first question, the, that elusive $100 bill, um, I think building a technology sector takes time, uh, and as someone who's been involved in developing technology as an investable asset class in the Gulf for some years, I've seen tremendous change and progress. Uh, the first level of change is, for the first time, leaders are talking about the importance of technology and diversifying the economies, and actually making political decisions to commit to invest in this. This is very significant. If you compare this with both the US and Europe, the support of government, both in terms of creating the necessary regulatory framework, but also to invest in technology, have been absolutely crucial in growing the technology sector in both countries. And we've seen this very clearly in Europe over the last few years. Europe has always lagged behind the US in terms of developing our technology sector. But for example, the commitment of the German government to develop Berlin into a tech hub, uh, the commitment of the UK government has developed London into a tech hub and I think we will see the same fruit of the political decisions uh, and the political will that we currently see in the GCC states with all the examples um, that my colleague from Tacnia cited. Um, so I think it is happening and I think it is happening in, in good time and I think there's a great deal of uh, momentum behind it and in my own experience as someone who's been um, preaching this in the desert, uh, this is a sea change. Um, the second observation I want to make is that, um, and I think this goes to our, um, our, our colleague's question about how will the C5 Amazon Web Services accelerate or contribute to the development of Bahraini talent. Uh, the second observation I want to make is I think as um, Khaled al Rumey, the CEO of the EDB, said this morning, um, to make the best of this enormous youth dividend which we have uh, in the GCC states, one of the youngest regions in the world, will require lateral thinking and innovative solutions. One, one can't go in a new direction by following an old path. And so therefore it requires innovative partnerships of the kind that we um, created, and although we announced it today, we've been working on this for more than a year. And both 
Amazon Web Services and C5 have been investing behind it. And as part of this partnership, we'll continue to invest behind it and invest foreign capital behind it. So I think it requires innovative solutions. I think it requires partners who are willing to invest and invest for the long term. Uh, Amazon Web Services is a very unusual company because although it's a big publicly listed company, the leadership of this company takes a long-term view and stick with it. Um, the third important point is this is about um, sharing know-how, technology, and skills that will make both Bahrain and contribute to the broader region's competitiveness. Uh, being part of the global tech sector today is not optional if you want to grow your country's economy in pace with the best of the world. And therefore, having access to this know-how, having access to these skills, having access to this technology, and having it transferred, transferred at scale combined with mentorship is absolutely crucial. And over a period of three years, uh, the program which we announced today will share this with 60 companies from Bahrain and across the region. And we expect a waterfall effect uh, from this investment. It's like throwing a, a small stone into a pond and seeing the ripple effect from it. And we, we expect that this technology and skill transfer will produce dividends and results and economic growth in, in many, many ways, both for Bahrain and for the region. Teresa, do you want to comment? Yes. I agree. My grandfather used to say, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. And I think this is one step toward doing something different. And as Andre said, these things don't happen overnight. And I wanted to address a couple of the, a couple of the questions. One was um, the tech youth and talent. And I had a little sticker here with me, and Andre brought it up, but I wanted to share. It's, uh, it says, hashtag smart is beautiful. Because I think uh, the women in the Middle East are beautiful inside and out, and they're very, very smart. And one of the initiatives I started almost two years ago uh, was not only with youth, but was, was with women and young girls, trying to ensure that we had a diversity of talent, uh, both with men and women, but the thing that we see in the tech sector is that we're missing a huge opportunity with women. Um, in the U.S. today, we only have 18 percent in computer science uh, programs that are women, and it's that same thing across the world. And we're looking at a massive growth of tech jobs, and we need to change that. So we can change that both at the school level and at the, at, the, at the primary grade school level and at the university level. So when we talk about how do we change um, technology and youth, it really does require policy, people, and technology. And it's got to be a partnership. Um, while, while private companies, and it's one of the things that we do at AWS, running the public sector business, when we go into an area, we go into a country, and one of the things that we want to do is have a deep partnership with the government because if you go in and you take an approach uh, that is longer term and you're trying to make a sea change, and technology is evolving so fast and it's changed, the chasm, crossing the chasm has really changed. It moves much, 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 much faster than it did uh, in years previously. And in order to really see that uh, take shape, you have to have the right partnership with the government, but you also have to have the right partnerships with the ecosystem of tech companies. And you asked the question on C5 and how do we work with C5. Well, we have uh, at Amazon Web Services thousands of partners, and C5 is both a technology uh, partner to us and a private equity partner at AWS, and we have many, many of those, but they are and a partner that really has passion for this region and understands the opportunity. So what we intend to do jointly is uh, grow the partner ecosystem together here and ensure that it's not just one or two uh, groups, but many, many more. And one of the things that I think we do best when we go into a region is we pull in many, many of our other partners. Um, as an example, we are already reaching out to our entire ecosystem that we have. 
and we're saying, okay, come with us. And what we've actually found is that there are many companies we already work with that have business here in the Middle East, but they're not necessarily taking advantage of the full technology opportunity. So we're already really, like Andre said, we haven't been working on this just recently. We've been working for, with, on this over a year, and we're just really making an announcement. In terms of the investment, for us, we are um, looking to do the investing with uh, what I chatted about in terms of we intend to put um, millions into the region with credits and uh, training and education and certifications. And really for us, it's a long-term view. It is a long-term view. We expect to get the benefit of this in the long term by having a technologically enabled society of both the, of both the youth the government and the businesses. So it really um, is that simple. We believe we are the cloud pioneer. We have seen a transformative shift in technology and the intent is really to work with the region to make that happen because the, the reality is today uh, they are a little behind, but that doesn't mean they can't catch up. We just have to have a concerted effort together on working on these, these areas of, of um, policy, people and technology, and I think the program that we've set up is a step, but there can be many, many more of these being set up by groups that have a vision of what they want to create, and it might be in an individual area like um, energy, or just health, or just cyber. Uh, so there could be many more of these. I think we're just a starting point for this. Thank you, Teresa. Abdul Rahman, do you want to add anything to answering the questions? or? Do you think we've been? I can address uh, the Dr. Emmett's uh, question. Uh, and very quickly, I think the GCC states uh, could do something like the deal today uh, and direct uh, the educational institutions, the economic development institutions, the uh, various government organizations to support such programs and such engagements. If we get more and more of such deals, then the whole economy will be shifted towards technology development and investment. And in my opinion, this is fairly easy. It, it's, it's not rocket science to, to find where to, to, to be competitive, uh, or you, you can be competitive, and that's what we at Takania uh, have done. Uh, we are focused and, and we know where, where, where to focus, uh, where to work and who to work with. Uh, and if this uh, is copied and imitated in, uh, across the region, uh, then we shall, we shall be taking a better uh, part and more of a vital more bit role in, into technology development globally. I think Yusuf, you have a further question. In, in, in my question, I put Tamkeen uh, in there because according to the news that came out today from, from your press conference, uh, that Tamkeen is actually investing in this project. Now, Tamkeen is not a government. Tamkeen, their money comes from the private sector. We actually pay taxes to the number of uh, expat employees that we have in our companies and it goes to the labor market and from there Tamkeen is actually is the labor fund and it is made for uh, uh, the Bahraini workers to be trained using that money and to make them the choice for the Bahraini uh, businesses. Now uh, this is where my point is, is, is uh, Tamkeen is a partner with you. Um, how is what you've done going to work uh, with Tamkeen. Uh, uh, is Tamkeen going to bring you Bahraini uh, uh, for training, for uh, uh, being entrepreneurs? Uh, uh, this, is, this is really what I wanted to know. Uh, because at the end, the question is going to come from private sector is, we pay this money, where does this money go? Uh, this, is, this is what I really wanted to know from, from uh, either. Thanks. 
Andre, do you want to take that one? No, I, I'm, I'm um, on the same page with you, Yusuf, about the importance of Tamkin. And as you know, when you work with an institution like Tamkin, over a period of time, you get to know the mission and the, the role and the, uh, and the purpose of this organization. So um, our understanding of Tamkin's role is exactly the same as yours. And um, one of the key areas, um, and this has been the subject of feedback which we've received, in which private sector companies would like to develop the skill set of uh, Bahraini employees is in the ICT sector. The ICT sector is uh, not only a growing sector in the Bahraini national economy, but also overlaps with so many of the other key sectors in the country, financial services, tourism, um, banking, um, but also the largest part of the country's economy, which consists of small and medium-sized companies, um, which is the biggest employer in the Bahraini economy, as you know. So I think it makes a lot of sense for Tamkin to work very closely with us on this project. And Tamkin, so far, and we're just at the start of the project, have been crucial in helping us understand the labor market in Bahrain, the areas in which uh, skills are acquired, the key areas in which um, Amazon Web Services can contribute in terms of transferring uh, cloud computing skills and related skills like coding to Bahraini employees to make them more employable, also to enable them to earn higher wages. And Tamkin has also been very useful in terms of using their network for us to access potential companies from Bahrain in the SME sector that can come into the accelerator program. And we really value all those investments from Tamkin in terms of knowledge sharing, access to the network, and so on very highly. And I'll just make one more quick statement. I met Tim Keen maybe almost a year ago, and a story I shared with them was um, when I go around the world, I have the opportunity to hear these amazing stories about how government and businesses are, are doing things a little bit differently to solve the unique problems that they have. Because what I find is every place is a little bit different. And one story that I shared with them was my last trip to Brazil. I met with uh, a CIO who was running a development board for a local entity in Brazil. They have, they have like regions that they work in. And in this region, um, I met with the CIO and he shared with me how he was using the AWS Activate program to power small and medium businesses. And I was like, wow. And so he told me the story, which is a free program that we offer for startup companies. And what he said was he, he touches 100,000 small and medium businesses a year. And this is in one small area of Brazil. He said, I touch 100,000 uh, small and medium businesses a year. So he got this idea to run this incubator program over a 22-week period. And each week, he would do a program for these startups. He would do a marketing. He did a tech. He did finance. He did VC. How do you raise capital? And he shared with me how he was using the AWS program. So I was like, that's great. I love it. So it was an example of how government was actually taking a private program that we offered. And what we did here, we presented that program to Tim Keen, which is a lot about the training and educational components. And what's really happening is we didn't want to just take that element. We really wanted to transform these companies in Bahrain. So really, they're in partnership with us because we want to look at this and say, how is this going to work in the first round and do we need to adjust? And between uh, EDB, Tim Keen, C5, and AWS, that's one of the key areas really to take these programs and say, are they working effectively here in the same way? Because we've had really good results. So one of the goals is really to share best practices around the world that we're seeing and Tim Keen was that perfect partner because of just what you described, Yusuf, that they're really trying, they're, they're responsible for training and education. Could that be expanded to new kind of companies? Is it the right kind of mission or should that mission be um, adjusted in some way as you think about the new tech economy and some of the areas that we've talked about are opportunities uh, for existing growth here in the region? 
Thank you. Um, Yamo, I think you have a question. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question that I think was asked, or at least implied earlier, but I haven't heard, yet heard an answer. Um, and it goes back to one of these uh, perennial debates in political economy, which is really about the relationship between technology and jobs. And the concern that many people have that technology, uh, revolutionary, if you like, disruptive technological change, not only creates jobs, it also destroys jobs in significant numbers. And of course, this region right now is going through a period when creating new jobs is the priority, certainly one of the priorities. Uh, now, we all accept, of course, the fact that uh, there is no credible alternative to taking the route that uh, you've been talking about, but how do you position, how do you articulate this opportunity, and how do you execute in a way that really puts these concerns to rest and, and creates a win-win for all concerned? Thank you, Yamo. Abdul Rahman, do you want to start with this one? Well, I guess the first step to do so is to know where you want to be in the future. And as I said earlier, to list the key sectors, the key areas where you want to operate and play. And then you will have to list all the required actions, the required plans, the required resources to reach that goal. And if that's through collaborating with the private sector, uh, forcing the private sector, because given the, the uh, political uh, structure of the DC states, I think you, you could do that sometimes. And if you could do that or uh, you could work internally uh, just like what's happening in Saudi Arabia today and trying to do uh, more and more of government initiatives and leaving the, the private sector alone, hoping for their philanthropist uh, spirit to help you while in the process. And, uh, and I, I don't think that's the, really the most effective way of doing it. Uh, the, be the best way of doing it is to encourage the private sector to work with you Towards, towards your goal, and if sometimes you have to force, then uh, you can. Andre, do you want to add something? Um, no, I think that's a, that's a really good question, and I think that's one of the tough questions of the 21st century. I think um, one of the aspects of technology that is often um, not recognized when this question is posed is how much of a boon without any cost technology delivers and what the significant role technology plays in redistributing wealth. The best example of this is the mobile phone which is now accessible to people on very modest incomes um, and at the same time gives them access to uh, more knowledge and information that a global leader would have had access to um, in a developed country 30, 40 years ago. Um, so um, I think in addition, to, in addition to fueling economic growth, and in the case of cloud computing, it's been proven that um, cloud computing can add 1 to 2 percent to the GDP growth of a national economy. I think there's also a great deal of a free distribution of knowledge and skills, or a low-cost redistribution of knowledge and skills that enhances economic growth. I agree with Abdul Rahman that uh, planning and policy play a key part in a successful result. And, um, and for governments to be focused on long-term planning is a, is a key, key ingredient. And then thirdly, I think Bahrain as a, as a small country with a, a highly skilled workforce um, is less at risk of this as a country rather than a country that either has an unengaged workforce or one that's more focused on uh, manual jobs and manual labor, which is more at risk of 
um, being made obsolete by technological innovation? Well, I think the horse and buggy driver said that same thing when the first car rolled off the factory floor. I think I've lost my job. But guess what? He or she hadn't. Um, and we have this term we say, you can't fight gravity. And technology is not going to stop. So uh, once you accept that technology is going to continue to evolve, then you have to create the right environment to ensure that your people are being skilled up, that you're aware of what's happening, and that you're, you're driving the change in the right way. Now, again, I shared, we, um, as a private company and the, the pioneer of cloud, feel like we have responsibility to share in ensuring that we're driving the right educational environment. Um, we're not there yet 100%, but we are working through the programs I shared, the AWS Educate program, which is a global program. Hashtag smart is beautiful. We want to do more things with the youth to create coding academies and programs. Uh, we support each year code.org, which I'm very proud. It's one of my favorite not-for-profits. And they're out of Seattle, but they're doing a global program where they literally support uh, teaching coding. Um, it's, it's a rolling thunder approach over a long period, but we ran that on AWS at no cost. And it's really teaching students how to code. And the jobs are real. They are out there. And when, again, I shared my experiences around the world, but one of the things I get asked all the time from governments and companies, can you help me get the skills I need? And there's skills from everything like big data analytics to cybersecurity to basic coding. So the jobs are there. They're definitely there. And, what, uh, and also the jobs that are there right now are not going to change overnight. Um, even at Amazon, we recognize that we're changing through the use of our robotics within our warehouses. And we have programs even for those individuals where we're training and educating them at universities for new, for new jobs. And um, the skills are pretty exciting, actually. The new skills, we just have to recognize that um, it's a shared responsibility model when it comes to educating and doing the transition. And it's got to be planned like everything else in a business. You've got to plan for it, and then you've got to execute uh, to make sure that's happening in the right way. OK, any further questions before we sum up here? I think it's been a, a very enlightening uh, session. I think it's been a very positive session. I think the whole day has been a very positive one, the whole, the whole event. Uh, I was struck uh, last night by the openness of the debate between the floor uh, and, and the minister. And uh, Yusuf had some pretty hard-nosed questions, which I think were, were, was, was actually a, a very good and very positive sign of the openness of the dialogue here in Bahrain, which I think augurs well. I think we've seen and we've heard of this panel a lot of, of initiatives that are taking place. This isn't just talking. I mean, there are things happening that are really interesting. I think cloud computing bringing that to this region has an has has uh, incredible transformative potential. We've heard a lot about education. Education clearly is a challenge. It's not one that's, I mean, a lot's been addressed. Again, we heard from the CEO of, uh, of, of the Bell Bank how, how important this is um, and how much uh, investment is taking place in the region. How, we've heard how many universities, world-class universities there are in Bahrain. This is obviously a very positive sign, but it's obviously something that needs to con continually be worked at given the sort of skills gap that people have talked about in this session and also elsewhere. So the challenges remain, but I think the potential uh, is enormous. I think the steps that have been taken are very encouraging, and um, I think that uh, we leave, I certainly leave this session with a, with a sense that things are moving in a very positive direction as far as the Gulf and technology in Bahrain in particular, uh, and I look forward to following progress from afar. So with that, I'm just going to hand over Sanjay, who is going to, I think, give us a few last words. I just have uh, one announcement to make and uh, a vote of thanks to all those who made this uh, forum uh, what it has been. The announcement, of course, is that uh, at 7 p.m. in the lawns behind the hotel facing the nice uh, seafront, we have a party. 
uh, with some drinks and music. And uh, for all those of you who have sat through this uh, day and uh, been good children in the classroom, come and have fun. Um, a vote of thanks. Um, yesterday, I thanked our uh, sponsors here in Bahrain uh, and, and, and my friends who made the geoeconomics program a success. Today, I thank my colleagues at the International Institute of Strategic Studies. First, the seven chairs of the seven sessions, uh, John Jenkins, Jen Stolstrop, Emil Hokayam, Toby Dodge, Pierre Noel, Bill Emmett, and Nelly Lahoud, who chaired the various sessions. Uh, second, my colleagues from London who are here, who helped uh, with the logistics of this conference, led by Thomas Leng and Sheena Patel, and including Alexander Buckle, James Howard, Lily Harkonnen, and Stephanie Love. And finally, my colleagues here in uh, Bahrain, uh, led by Katada Zaman, the managing direct, uh, director of the IISS uh, Middle East office, and including uh, my colleague Hassan Al Rais, Mahmoud Abdullah, Imran Khan, Andrew Kelly, Celis Jones, Erica Brewers, Fatima Al Hassan, Habatala Taha, Janak Narayan, Mohammed Al Shamlan, Praveen Devraj, Tote Praveen Devraj, Wendy Pereira, uh, Zara Salman, and of course my dear friend Yusuf Mubarak. Thank you all very much for the excellent work all of you put in uh, to make this uh, Bahrain Bay Forum a success. Uh, I do hope that um, we will now make this an annual event and uh, that many of you will be here, will here again uh, next year. Thank you and join us for the party. <laughs>